Batman were two of the early um, stars of our serial documentary that we put up on YouTube. And uh, indeed, quite a cast of characters in this uh, documentary. When you take a look at the citizens, when you uh, uh, the uh, people who uh, basically came out to defend the Hispanic uh, community, uh, obviously there was that uh, counterpart of, uh, I mean, it was just, it was vitriolic at times, it would seem to me. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I think what happens is when you actually marry the divisiveness of uh, partisanship to racial uh, anxieties and racial polarization, um, it, especially in the context of an election, mm -hmm. then things can become really hyperbolic and hysterical, actually because people are no longer filtering information based on whether it's accurate or verifiable. They accept and reject information based on whether it helps or hurts their candidate or their cause. And so people take liberties with that and begin to say things that, you know, if they were true, yes, would be cause for alarm, but so often they're just simply not true. They're completely false, but they're uh, heightening the level of anger or hysteria that supports a polit political candidate or um, or a policy. Yes, I'm uh, speaking with uh, Eric uh, Byler, who is a co-producer and director, along with Annabelle Park, of 9500 uh, Liberty, which, as he just explained, was the address in uh, Prince Williams County, uh, where a giant banner had been put up uh, by a, a Hispanic American. A Mexican American. A Mexican American. Yes. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, f fighting back for what was going on in terms of what they perceive to be uh, racism, and, right. and which many people consider SB 1070, for instance, to be a, a racist uh, law. That's a, just a point of view that seems to be rather prevalent in the argument. Well, I think that that is the most hurtful way to put it, and I think many people do feel hurt. Uh, they feel as if the law is directed at the Latino community, and I think other people who really value tolerance and diversity are, are also hurt by the law. And so they choose to use the word racist um, as a way to hurt people back. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think that's necessary. I don't think it's helpful. It certainly isn't helpful. Well, you know, I do find it interesting. Uh, you are representing a, a group that basically is uh, funding you to go statewide and present this uh, uh, film, uh, 9500 Liberty. And uh, I, I think that there's a confluence of missions between yourself mm -hmm. and this organization, which is basically trying to foster um, a productive uh, conversation about this issue. And it would, it would seem to me that there's a lot of work left to be done in that <laughs> regard. Yes, but I'm, I'm very confident that it's going to get better. Uh, and the story that we went through, uh, which is very much linked to your story because the what you refer to as outsiders who wrote our law in Prince William County also wrote your law. This is an anti-immigration lobbying firm in Washington, D.C., who have sort of a menu of boilerplate uh, p pieces of legislation that they um, suggest to local advocates against illegal immigration and uh, politicians. Well, in fact, then, to what extent are these um, smaller uh, legislations really modeled, af modeled after federal legislation, as is claimed? Oh, uh, that's, that's not accurate. Um, um, that is a claim um, that is made in order to counter the supremacy argument, which is actually the foundation of the uh, federal um, the Justice Department's case against SB 1070. They're not actually talking about racial profiling in that um, case. What they're saying is, is that um, because we all agreed to be one nation in 1787, we ratified the Constitution, actually it was 1788, uh, what we agreed to do is not have separate uh, policies for each state with regard to foreign relations or trade mm -hmm. uh, or immigration. And to have one state um, decide to make their own immigration policy um, is uh, in violation of our Constitution, the supremacy clause of our Constitution. Well, then uh, the, the people of uh, Arizona then have been lied to by its governor and other people who contend that this, uh, that this 10, SB 1070 is a mirror image of federal legislation, and so uh, therefore what could be wrong with it? Well, I wouldn't say lie, but I think that, um, you know, who knows to what degree the governor really understands what's in the Constitution. I think that people use it uh, to uh, further their agenda in the present tense um, without much regard for um, the um, 
environment in which it was written. But when we wrote the Constitution, one of our concerns was that the many different states each had individual treaties with the Native Americans. And it was impossible for us to live up to our Republican values where we declared ourselves in belief that all men are created equal, for instance, where we are continuously defying these treaties and really being unfair to the Native people of our land. And so Jefferson and Washington, John Jay, Henry Knox really, really wanted to have a federal policy with regard to peoples who were not exactly within our, we weren't sure how to treat the Native Americans. So that's why we have a supremacy clause, is that if we all agree to be one nation, then we should have one policy with regard to things like foreign policy, immigration, and trade. And I understand that. And I don't want to over belabor this, but it really sticks out in my mind. And once again, I told you before we started this interview, I do understand both sides of this issue, and I truly do. And I don't really get awfully worked up about one side or the other. I think there's problems on both sides. But it seems to me like it was made very clear by this governor and others that this is a mirror image of federal laws, legislation, and reflected absolutely the Constitution. And I don't know, if you don't call that a lie, what do you call it? I mean, I don't think you can really blame it on ignorance. I think it's spin. But let me give you an example of why, if we agree to stay one nation, if we agree that unity as a people is important, that we should allow the federal government to have the jurisdiction that the Constitution outlines. Let's say that we had an embargo against North Korea because of our fear that they're going to develop nuclear weapons. And so no trade between the United States and North Korea. And then let's just say the state of North Dakota decides that, you know, we're going to mirror federal policy. And we are going to have a policy that requires anyone who we have reasonable suspicion might be Korean. We need to check and make sure they're not doing any trade with their relatives in North Korea. Annabelle, by the way, has relatives in North Korea and South Korea. I see. My partner. That's tough. That would be unfair. Oh, yeah, it's a terrible tragedy for her family what happened in that war. And it's part of the reason why Annabelle and I are very much pacifists when it comes to people who try to divide our country and America. But in any case, if the state of North Dakota decided they were going to help federal policy by having their own embargo against North Korea, you could make the argument, yes, it mirrors the federal policy. But let's just say that our State Department wanted to relax that embargo in order to give the North Koreans an incentive to allow inspectors. Well, if North Dakota is doing its own embargo, that will impede the federal government's ability to do its foreign policy. So I think there's a good reason why our forefathers declared that if we are to become one nation, that the separate individual states cannot be making their own policy. Right, right. Or we cease to be a nation. Right. And unfortunately, you know, the argument that we shouldn't necessarily have a strong federal government, that's part of our, it's part of the fabric of our society as well. The anti-federalists oppose the ratification of the Constitution. And many Virginians oppose the ratification of the Constitution, including Patrick Henry. But there are other Virginians, such as James Madison and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, who supported being one nation. The anti-federalists eventually grew into the Confederates and really used Patrick Henry's argument against the Constitution to justify the secession of the southern states after the election of Abraham Lincoln. And today I would say that the inheritors of the anti-federalist argument or the Confederate argument are those who oppose the civil rights legislation. Or, you know, in Virginia in 1967, the federal government struck down a law that banned interracial marriage in Virginia. 1967, the year my parents were married, in fact, was the year that we were allowed to marry people of different races in Virginia. So I think that there is a long tradition of people who oppose the federal government making laws that apply to people in the different states. But in my opinion, when we ratified the Constitution, and if not then, when we had our Civil War, we decided that a house divided cannot stand and that we must be one country.